Uh, today we're going to talk about the another aspect of the European conquest of Africa, uh, focusing on the period really 1880 until the conquest was really complete in the very early 20th century. Um, we've examined various aspects of this in terms of the scramble, in terms of w which uh, European countries took which parts of Africa and why in a certain sense they were really had the military power, the military might to do pretty much anything they wanted anywhere in the non-European world. Uh, and they took advantage of that opportunity to establish uh, control of of territory, not just in Africa, but in Asia, the Pacific Islands, and 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 a limited extent elsewhere as well. And in the case of Africa, uh, this is the period we really talk about in terms of the beginning of the colonial period. Although, as we all know, uh, Britain was in South Africa uh, by the very very early 19th century, and in Sierra Leone as well. Uh, and France was in what's now Senegal uh, throughout and expanded its uh, position in Senegal throughout the 19th century. So there are some modifications as, uh, of, of the general pattern of um, European conquest. But most of the conquest occurred after the Congress of Berlin in 1884 uh, when European uh, uh, countries met uh, in Berlin uh, without any African representation and determined which parts of Africa belong to which European countries uh, with any, without any consultation. Uh, then the actual scramble occurred as uh, European powers uh, really found themselves in a position that if they didn't occupy territory, uh, then some other European power just might do it. Uh, so that is the over, uh, overriding um, chronology that led to the uh, British domination of, of uh, much of West Africa, and uh, French domination of much of the Sahel and, and Sahara in West Africa, and uh, the uh, two on, uh, three enclaves of the Germans in Togo and Cameroon and in what's now Tanzania. Uh, Portugal in its domination in Mozambique and in Angola and in Guinea-Bissau. Uh, and the Belgians uh, allowed to take Congo as, as, a, as a means of making sure that the French and the German and the Brits didn't take uh, the Congo region, which is the only reason the Belgians were there. Uh, so that is the situation. Now what I want to talk about really today is a, a crisis that occurred, especially in West Africa, uh, because of the fact that a very large uh, proportion of the population was in a condition of slavery, uh, slavery to African masters, uh, Africans enslaved in African countries, um, and many of them in West Africa actually being Muslim countries, but not entirely. And, and in all of these countries in West Africa, the Sokoto Caliphate, Fouta Jalon, Fouta Toro, Ashanti, uh, the various Yoruba states, <clears throat> the enslaved population uh, found the European conquest an opportune time to stage a massive resistance, and they did that in the form of running away from their masters. And so that, in effect, what today I'm talking about is the European conquest and what can be called the fugitive slave crisis. At the time of the European conquest, uh, there was the opportunity for people who were in conditions of slavery to run away. And the reason for that is, is because temporarily the local power structure broke down because of the presence of the European armies. And the European powers uh, didn't have enough of control on the ground to prevent uh, the massive desertion of enslaved people from their masters. And so that's what I want to talk about to some extent today, the reason why this happened and the implications. Uh, first of all, there's one of, the, one of the ironies of the European conquest of Africa is that the European powers gave all kinds of reasons, excuses, justification uh, 
for the conquest and the occupation of Africa. In some ways, that can be summarized as it was in English at the, at the time, of, of the idea that Europeans were introducing civilization because Africans were not civilized. A second feature was that, is that Europeans were in, introducing uh, Christianity religion uh, because the religions of most Africans, and they were not talking about Muslims in this case, but the religion of most Africans was considered to be barbaric uh, and primitive. Uh, and the third reason, which was more straightforward, related to commerce, that is trade. And what they were really doing, the European powers, is they were making it possible for European companies and firms uh, to, in effect, take over the economies of Africa uh, under the guise of colonialism. So sometimes this is called the three C's, uh, um, civilization, uh, colonialism, uh, commerce, um, and Christianity. These are all C's, and these were the reasons that are being given by the Europeans uh, for their intervention in Africa. In reality, what the European countries were doing, and this is Germany, France, Britain, and Portugal, uh, the Italians were less successful, uh, although they, they did try in Ethiopia and they did try in Libya. Uh, but what the European powers were really doing was inter introducing a period of dictatorship uh, over a non-European people and imposing dictatorial regimes uh, that uh, became known as colonialism. Uh, colonialism had its new meaning because historically colonialism really meant when Europeans went overseas and settled in other areas of the world, they established colonies. But in most of Africa, Europeans did not settle. It was simply a, a question of European occupation uh, control by m the military, uh, administration by a f handful of Europeans, uh, and uh, the allowance for European companies uh, and North American companies too uh, to in effect take over the economies of these areas. Uh, in some extent for the purpose of mineral development, other places for agricultural produce, uh, but in all cases, uh, uh, using the, the, the might of the colonial armies uh, to, in effect, occupy Africa. And they could do so because of the technological advantage at the end of the 19th century. It's not like now. It's then, the military might was entirely in the hands of European countries. They had the best technology they were in the position to take advantage of the new types of technology that were rapidly coming out, uh, f such as the machine gun, which was one of the, the basic uh, military um, apparatus that was used in the conquest of Africa. And of course, if one side has only old-fashioned guns and the other side has machine guns, there's no battle because one side can just wipe out the other side quite easily. And that's what the Europeans really um, uh, took advantage of. The second thing that they took advantage of is they had artillery that could blow holes through the walls of towns uh, very easily without any resistance. And so therefore, those parts of Africa that was really were, where warfare was dominated by the horse, uh, the, between the artillery and, and machine guns, there was no contest. And so therefore the European conquest, when it took place, took place quite rapidly. Uh, and while there was resistance, uh, as often as not, the resistance was very short-lived because it was very clear that the, it was impossible to resist uh, the advance of the European armies. Today, as we know, uh, because of terrorism and other things, that it's very possible and very easy to get all kinds of weapons uh, into the hands of people that aren't even governments. So things today are extremely different than they were at the end of the 19th century. The other feature of the European conquest is while the armies were British and German and French, uh, the soldiers were not. The officers were Europeans, but most of the soldiers were Africans themselves. 
And who were they actually? In the French, the Senegalese Terreliers, which were the, the French colonial army in West Africa, was made up almost entirely of fugitive slaves, of people who had run away from their masters, uh, enlisted in the, in the French army, uh, were given guns, and then turned around and attacked the people who had previously been their masters. Of course, they had no loyalty to the masters. Uh, they had a loyalty to themselves, and they were given the means of joining an army uh, and, in effect, taking revenge, and not only taking revenge, but benefiting from the conquest because the soldiers that worked for the French, uh, in effect, were, were paid relatively well. They weren't paid as much as Europeans, of course, but they were paid better than a lot of the local people for whatever they were doing. The British did exactly the same thing. Uh, and when they took over Nigeria, when they took over what's now Ghana, uh, they did the same thing. They used, to a very great extent, uh, slaves who had run away from their masters and had enlisted in the British forces and then turned around and, uh, and conquered the, the states and the polities uh, that, uh, from where they had come and where they had been enslaved. And so that is the basis of actually the African military uh, right down to almost to the present was the, was the enlistment of people who had no real stake in the existing political structure and therefore could be easily co-opted uh, for purposes of colonial conquest and then subsequently for colonial domination of the territories that were taken over. And so, obviously, another feature when an army which is made up mostly of fugitives uh, who had joined the, 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 the colonial army, uh, when they went through areas, it was very easy for them to say, listen, if you're a slave, run away, join us, because uh, we're fighting um, our former masters. So, one of the ironies, the second irony about the European conquest, the, the French, the Belgian, the Portuguese, uh, the German occupation, is that, of course, Europeans had to justify what they were doing. And they did it not only in terms of civilization and Christianity and commerce, but they did it also in terms of, of pronouncing that they were the saviors of the enslaved population, that they were fighting slavery. And this was really ironic, of course, because the very countries that said that's what they were doing at the end of the 19th century were the countries that had controlled the slave populations of the Americas in the first place. And it only very recently, within a generation or two, had liberated and emancipated the enslaved populations in the Americas. And now they're turning around and they're saying, oh, they're the champions of anti-slavery and therefore, in effect, justified the mass desertion of slaves during the conquest. But hold on, that didn't last for long because it was fake. It was a lie. Because as soon as every one of the European uh, powers took over the territories that they occupied, they immediately tried to prevent slaves from running away. They did not emancipate slaves, and they tried to maintain the power of their masters in the existing political structures. And instead, what, instead they, in establishing the colonial dictatorship, uh, what they did, in effect, was they co-opted the aristocracy and the existing ruling classes everywhere they went and tried to keep them in power. Uh, and tried to reinforce their powers by trying to keep the slaves in place. So they ha there's the contradiction. On the one hand, uh, the, the European countries seemed to be encouraging anti-slavery. On the other hand, on the ground, once they were in firm control, they stopped that because they did not want social disruption. They were never enough Europeans in any of the colonies to really establish uh, a, a, a European administration. In every one of the European uh, colonies, it was necessary to co-opt local officials, to co-opt other people, and absorb them into the colonial administration. 
so that the colonial administrations consisted of really two parts. One, a white elite that came from Europe, and two, the overwhelming, uh, the tax collectors, the local police, the local administrators, all of whom were local Africans. And so that you had this co-option that went on and the attempt to stop the fugitive, uh, uh, this, uh, stop slaves from becoming fugitives and running away. Now, in the article, or one article that, uh, and the one that's assigned uh, for this week, is, uh, is an article by Richard Roberts and Martin Klein, and it explores one of these particular uh, episodes in the, the French Western Sudan. That it started in a town, a, a, a small city by the name of Banamba, um, which is in today in the country of Mali. And what happened basically was that the French uh, got themselves into a contradiction and realized that the press back in France was watching what the colonials were doing and were pointing out some of the contradictions. In other words, they pointed out, well, you said you're against slavery, uh, but you're trying to keep slaves from running away. Now, what is it? Are you against slavery or are you for it? And so this put many of the colonial officials in an embarrassing position. And so the colonial regime in, in French West Africa uh, did some uh, investigations and discovered that slaves were indeed running away to a great extent and the local French officers were doing their best to stop that uh, in order to make sure that they, they could impose taxes, that uh, order and civil government could be maintained. In short, they wanted a law and order. They didn't want, you know, fugitives running around and doing anything they want. Uh, and, and so, uh, in, in, in 1905, the whole situation came to a really crisis to a head because the French had been saying up until then, no, you can't run away, you, we're not allowing you to run away, even though their army was made up of people who had run away. And even though some people had run away and the French had established them in villages, which they called, ironically, villages of liberty, uh, which they use as a labor pool to build the railroad and to do other public works uh, projects. Uh, and so they were in effect taking advantage of the fugitive crisis, but trying to stop it. Uh, but, in, but in 1905 they gave up and they said, we're not going to stop it anymore. Anybody who wants to run away can run away, we're not going to stop it. And so that the, it came to a head at that time. And in the end, over 250,000 people ran away. 250,000 people who were in state of slavery ran away. Many of them went to, uh, back to where they, they or their parents had come from originally and had been enslaved. But many others uh, went into the cities. Many others went to areas where they could get jobs in growing peanuts, and particularly in Senegal. Many of them actually joined a brotherhood that is known as the Maurids, which is today uh, the most powerful um, Muslim brotherhood in Senegal, the Maurids. And they joined the Maurids because the Maurids established villages for fugitive slaves where they could, where they could grow peanuts, have an income, and get an education. Uh, and they established them all along the railroads that were built through Senegal. Uh, and turned the Maurids into a very prosperous brotherhood and also provided sanctuary and economic opportunity for a lot of people who couldn't go home or didn't want to go home because they had been enslaved in ways or their parents had been enslaved in ways that they didn't want to remember and they didn't want to go back to those places. So that's what happened in, French, uh, in the French areas as you can read in more detail in Roberts uh, and Klein. Similarly, in the British areas of, of, um, of northern Nigeria, um, the same thing happened. The Sokoto Caliphate that we've looked at, which was the largest state in Africa at the time, was conquered between uh, 1897 and 1903 by the French, the British, and the Germans. Uh, 
the Germans taking what uh, became northern Cameroon, the French taking what's the modern country of, of Niger uh, and Burkina Faso, uh, the British taking uh, the, the, the biggest part by far, uh, which is today the no many of the northern states of Nigeria. Uh, and in each case, uh, the French, the Germans, the British face the same dilemma that I've just described for the Western Sudan. Uh, they all relied on armies that were made up predominantly of fugitive slaves. Uh, they conquered areas where there was an extremely large enslaved population. And they all talked about uh, this conquest as being liberating and civilizing uh, until they actually had complete control, in which, at which point they imposed the, a different, the dictatorships of French West Africa, British Nigeria, and German Cameroon. Uh, but at the same, it was the same situation, which is that when the armies went through the countryside and when they subdued the aristocracy and made them, in effect, surrender uh, and submit to the establishment of colonial rule, it gave the people who were on the farms uh, and who were in conditions of slavery the opportunity to run away. Now we know that most the 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 the, the, the a very very large um, uh, number of people, hundreds of thousands of people, actually did run away. We also know that hundreds of thousands of people didn't. They stayed behind. They stayed where they were. They renegotiated the terms of servitude with their masters. Uh, they, uh, they, they remained. But many, many hundreds of thousands of people simply deserted and ran away. And this, of course, therefore, in the first decade of uh, colonial rule, the colonial authorities were confronted with, with this massive demographic relocation of population. Uh, that was a result of, in effect, the demise of slavery. None of the three European co uh, powers, uh, Germany, France, or Britain, actually abolished slavery, and none of them formally emancipated slaves. So this is the unbelievable feature of colonial rule, is that in all three cases, colonial rule continued slavery well into the 20th century. And in fact, uh, northern Nigeria did not finally abolish slavery until 1936, on the eve of World War II. Uh, not until 1936. This is a hundred years uh, after the emancipation of slaves in Jamaica, which was in 1834. So you see the significance and you also see the hypocrisy of British colonial rule and indeed so-called British civilization. Um, and so that what happened is that the numbers of people in what became northern Nigeria, the protectorate of northern Nigeria, uh, that was displaced and who migrated uh, was enormous. So a simple view of colonialism uh, as being a negative factor uh, has to be adjusted. It was negative in a certain kind of way uh, that we will see in greater detail over the coming weeks. Uh, we will see the result of European policies uh, in terms of, of taxation, in terms of uh, land, uh, control of land, and, and, and many other facets. Um, but we also have to recognize that the European conquest allowed people who were in a condition of slavery the opportunity to escape from slavery. And so for those individuals, it, it, it was not perceived as something as negative, but something that was an opportunity, even though in the end the Europeans didn't like the fact that that's what happened. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit more about what happened to the enslaved population uh, since, um, as in the case of the Muslim areas of West Africa, such a large uh, part of the population was in a condition of slavery at the time of the European conquest. 
And so many ran away, as I've, as I've indicated. But not everybody. And that created certain types of problems. Uh, for example, what the British did and what the French did is that they made the trading of people as slaves, that is human trafficking, they made that illegal. They made that a criminal offense. They also made kidnapping and the actual enslavement of people a criminal offense. Uh, they didn't want that to continue, even though they didn't emancipate the enslaved population. In short, if you were already a slave, uh, they, didn't, they looked the other way, but they didn't want any, uh, anybody newly enslaved and uh, they wanted to prevent uh, kidnapping and raiding and things like that, although in isolated areas of West Africa, such as the region that today where Boko Haram is so active, uh, in that area, uh, enslavement of people lasted uh, well into the 1930s before colonial regime was strong enough to stop local officials from conducting raids into the hills and capturing people that lived up in the mountains and just enslaving them and indeed in many cases um, uh, uh, performing castration on young boys uh, to create eunuchs who were in demand in certain parts of the Islamic world. And so uh, some enslavement continued even though it was considered criminal and, and all three regimes, the British, the French, the Germans, were pretty uh, strong about trying to stop it. It just, because they were so thin on the ground and so few European officers, it took longer than one might expect. Uh, but they tried to stop the actual, they closed all of the slave markets, for example, and they made it very clear that in, uh, slave trading was um, illegal and was a criminal offense. Although the fines well, were not that stiff if somebody was caught buying and selling some, somebody, it was usually a monetary fine that wasn't very heavy and it was usually a very short period in jail if they went to jail. Uh, so it could have been a lot tougher uh, in trying to stamp it out, but they, but they did try. And nonetheless, in the early years, uh, there were all kinds of um, um, tricks that were done. The, the local courts, the Islamic courts and other local tribunals that heard judicial cases, um, sort of looked the other way when issues of slavery came before the judges. Uh, here was one type of trick that happened. If somebody wanted to purchase a woman uh, for purposes of concubinage, uh, the, 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 a man would go to the court and tell the judge that he was freeing the woman. He was paying her purchase price, her emancipation price, to her master so that she would become free. But in reality, what he was doing was transferring the slave rights to that woman and was in effect buying her and was using the courts as a mechanism uh, for legitimating the transfer without going through the slave market. So the man paid the money, the, the woman left uh, the master, one master and in effect became the slave of the person who paid the money. And so it was a trick. Uh, when the British caught on to that, which took them a you know, quite a while, and then to convince all the judges that this was no longer legal, they had to throw a couple of judges in jail for corruption and things like that before they stopped that practice. Uh, and, then, and then a new uh, type of situation arose because the men who were wealthy enough and wanted to have uh, more than uh, not only their legal wives, but wanted to have um, uh, enslaved women as their concubines, uh, which under Islamic law at the time was legal, uh, but not under British law. Uh, and then uh, something new happened, because the way the British imposed their reforms of slavery, which is the way they saw what they were doing, they abolished slave trading, they abolished uh, 
uh, enslavement, but they did not abolish slavery. Uh, what they did say was that anybody born after March 1st, 1901, had to be born free and could not be born as a slave. And so therefore, there was a period of time uh, when there were lots of children around who had been born after 1901 who were legally and technically now free, and, but their parents were not. And so here was the contradiction where what the colonial regime uh, suddenly discovered was around 1916, 1917, 1918, parents were going to court and to protect their daughters from confiscation and, and, and for, forcibly put into a condition of concubinage. And so they were going to court to assert that their daughters were born after 1901 and therefore were technically free and therefore could not be uh, treated as a slave. So the courts in the early period helped the slave owners and in the second period helped those who were still in slavery uh, to protect their children. So this was what was going on within the colonial regime for, for the first uh, 20 years. 30 years was a problem with what to do about this massive enslaved population, particularly those who would not run away. Uh, and so that the social change and the demographic change under colonialism was much more complicated than just seeing it as a, uh, the nasty colonial masters who impose a terrible draconian system uh, on uh, the, the, the poor subject population. What was really happening was an alliance between the colonial regimes and the, and the existing aristocracy and ruling class uh, and the subjugation of the vast majority of the population, uh, even as part of that population tried to manipulate the opportunities to improve their status, and in many cases successfully did so. So that is uh, the end of this lecture in terms of um, what happened under the colonial regime and the fugitive slave crisis that happened as a result of the military conquest and the temporary breakdown of law and order uh, at that time and the opportunities that that presented to the subjugated population until the various colonial powers could really impose their dictatorial regimes uh, on the, the different areas that they controlled.